This is Katrin with Disability Rights New York. Welcome to our podcast, Empire State of Rights Closed Captioned. We are here to bring you information on the most relevant topics regarding disability rights and advocacy. It's National Disability Employment Awareness Month, so for the duration of October, we are highlighting subjects regarding employment for people with disabilities. Today, we have Jeremy Demick, staff advocate here at DRNY. He's here to discuss the basics of the plan to achieve self-support. Hey, Jeremy, how you doing? Hey, Catherine. Good, good. So, yeah, let's let's talk about the plan to achieve self-support. Sounds good. Why don't you start by telling us, what is it? What's the plan to achieve self-support? So, the easiest way to describe this is... That it's a plan in Social Security that allows people to set aside extra money from their SSI or SSDI money to put towards an employment goal. And um, that's the basic premise of how it works. And can you tell us just quickly, you used a couple of acronyms in there. Can you tell us what SSA and SSI are? Sure. SSA, we use that often here at Disability Rights New York, and it stands for Social Security Administration. And SSI is a program in Social Security that stands for Supplemental Security Income. And that's a a disability, Social Security disability income that you can receive. That's one of the programs. The other acronym, um, SSDI, stands for Social Security Disability Insurance. And that's, that's a different program, but it's a program where you usually have enough work experience or work history to be eligible for the SSDI program, whereas SSI, you don't necessarily have to have work experience to be eligible for it. Okay. And so how does someone begin to set up a plan to achieve cell support? And what does the overall process look like? So the process, you would first fill out or you would obtain an application and then fill that out. You can contact the past specialists or plan to achieve self-support specialists and they can you could talk to them about an employment goal that you may have like going back to school setting up a small business for example those are two different things or obtaining a job in the community and they can send you an application after you talk to them and you fill out the application or you can work with an advocate like an independent living center to help you on constructing the plan and the plan is very stepwise. It's You just plan like, hey, I'm going to set aside this X amount of money to achieve this goal, like going to college so I can obtain a degree or a certificate, and then I could do X job after I obtain this. And you would sort of put in estimates of time, like I'm going to be in school for two years, or I'm going to save for something like a car so I can get back and forth to work, and that's going to take X amount of time, like a year and a half, two years, whatever it may be. And so are there limitations on what you can use the plan to achieve self-support or PASS program for? That really depends on what the PASS specialist thinks. If you put in something in there that they don't feel relates to your employment goal, they may not approve it. Um, They may ask you to take that out or they may say, I'll approve A, B, and C on the application of things that you've wrote in there, but that letter D in terms of that option, I'm not approving that. Okay, so it doesn't have to be approved in total. Parts of it could, and that's what your your counselor would help you really determine or get that plan to be a little bit more specific to reach your goals. The past specialist or Social Security plan to achieve self-support specialist can work with you to work out the things that are not working in the plan or the things that they're not going to approve. They might say, you know, I'll approve a computer for you, but it's got to be within X amount of money. You can't buy something that's like over $1,500. I want you to find a laptop or a PC that doesn't go over that price. That was going to be my next question. So is there a limitation on the dollar amount that can be used here? Or is it based specifically on the plan and the items that the plan is going to be used for? It's not really limited to a dollar amount. It's more the resources the individual has to set aside for the plan. Say someone has SSI and they're working part-time and they'd like to work full-time or use that part-time money to go to school. They could take all of that extra money and set that aside for the goal. As long as it fits into the timeline, um, like 
if they say to the past specialist, hey, I'm going to save, I'm working 20 hours a month right now, I'd like to work full time, but I know I need to go to college to do that. The past specialist could work something out where they say, okay, the 20 hours that you're working, we're going to set all that money aside. And we know this is going to take two, three years of setting aside this money. All of that money, there's no cap on it. Unlike clients who are going through Access VR, the Commission for the Blind, there may be caps on the amount that can be provided for services. Whereas this could be something where there isn't a cap. It's just more based on the cap is really the resources that you have from working or extra money you have and time. So the past specialist may not approve something like if you said to a past specialist, hey, I want to do a past plan for 10 years, they'd probably say no. But something within the realm of reasonable, like two or three years, maybe four years, they probably would say yes to that if, as long as it's a reasonable goal. Okay. So time is a, a big factor when putting together this plan. Yeah, I would, I would say so. The time is probably the bigger factor in, in this. Okay. Now let's talk about who could benefit from a plan to uh, achieve self-support. That would be anyone that's receiving SSI who's got extra money to set aside, like part-time employment, individuals with SSDI, and individuals who are going through Access VR and the Commission for the Blind. This is actually a great option for people going through Access VR and the Commission for the Blind because the amount of money that you have for services or items in a past plan doesn't offset or reduce the amount of money or services you can receive from Access VR or the Commission for the Blind. It's a great sort of add-on to that program. The only catch with SSDI that I have to mention is that in the last year, the program's changed a little bit. So now you have to go through an additional disability determination to become eligible for the pass if you have SSDI. So you have to go back and qualify for SSI now, which sounds a little tricky or convoluted, but if anyone has questions, you know, I'd be happy to talk to them more about this. That's good information. So can you be filling out your Access VR application and your plan to achieve self-support application at the same time? Technically, you could. I mean, what I found in experience as a CAP advocate is more people know about Access VR. Um, some people still refer to it under the old name as Vested, but they don't necessarily know about the past plan through Social Security. And it's one of those things like, this program or plan to achieve self-support has been around since the 70s, but it's not advertised. It's um, even if you go into a Social Security office, no one there is going to tell you at that when you get to the front desk, like, hey, we have this plan and you could benefit or you may be able to benefit from it. It's just it's sort of hidden. So that's one of the things that we do here is we let people know about it and how to utilize it. Exactly. And so let's talk a little bit about uh, how does a plan to achieve self-support help someone achieve their employment goals? It really, it gives them a hand up in a way because what typically happens when someone works and they have SSI or SSDI is that your earnings that you make from part-time or full-time work offset the amount of money that you make from SSI or SSDI. And the rules for SSI and SSDI are different. With SSI, it sort of works like an equation, which sort of offsets the money that you make. With the pass, you can use the money, you can set aside the money without having these offsets where it reduces, where work would typically reduce the amount of money you make in your SSI or SSDI checks. So this is absolutely an advantage to this. The special note for SSDI is that you become eligible for SSI if you have an approved PASS plan at the same time you have your SSDI. So say, just for simple math, if you make $1,200 in SSDI per month and you get an approved PASS plan to go back to college to become a lab technician or a teacher, that's the goal. So you can set aside that $1,200 in SSDI all of that would go in the past, but you'd become eligible for SSI to pay your rent and your food and utilities. So they would be co-occurring at the same time. But with the SSDI money in the past plan, you can only use that for approved past expenses. So it's got to be, in this scenario that I just illustrated, it has to be all money going to approved past expenses. So that's some of the, the tricks and things in the program. So if someone has a question regarding the process, who can they contact or where can they go for more information? That's a good question. 
they can speak to the past specialist at Social Security, or they could talk to advocates through Disability Rights New York, like myself, or they could speak to individuals and advocates like peer advocates at independent living centers, and they could help them out and guide them through this process. Jeremy, thank you so much for talking to us about this today. It sounds like there's a lot of information out there for people regarding this past program. Thank you for having me. Empire State of Rights closed captioned has been brought to you by Disability Rights New York, your source for disability rights and advocacy. If you enjoyed our program, make sure to subscribe, like, and share this post. If there is a subject you would like us to discuss, please email podcast at drny.org or comment below. Tune in next Wednesday, where we'll bring you more information on disability rights in the state of New York. The closed captioned version of this podcast is available on our YouTube channel. To listen to more Empire State of Rights closed caption, follow us on iTunes and Spotify.